Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Thank you. This Risa. is show number four, yep. and we had a great show last week talking about all of the things that St. Louisans might be familiar with yes. about the great scary piazza bird <laughs> and, and, and the um, and the confluence of the Missouri and the Mississippi. Yeah, the, which are all very interesting things if you have the time to to definitely go see in the um, in the area. Yeah, they really are. And and you can imagine seeing him for the first time from a canoe. I mean, <laughs> Father Marquette must have had eyes the size of saucers. I, I can imagine and think, what are we going to experience? Yeah. And yeah, now I'm, they've come across big rocks. <laughs> and, and they continued on further south beyond that. The next thing that uh, they come to is really the confluence of another great river, this coming from the east, the Ohio River. Okay. Wow. Okay. wow. I mean, it had to be awe-inspiring. I mean, it had to be awe-inspiring. I mean, here they are on one of the, lo- the, 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 the widest rivers they've ever seen. I mean, Europe doesn't have anything quite like the Mississippi. Even the Rhine, the Danube, they're not quite the Mississippi. Mississippi, but then you've got rivers like the the Missouri, and mm-hmm. there's the Ohio that, that had to be absolutely awe-inspiring for uh, for them to see this this great confluence of all of these continental rivers just coming together like that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But interestingly enough, the one thing that caught their attention now that we see in Father Marquette's um, uh, rec- records in his notes is the two things that stood out and. We should know them here in St. Louis, the incredibly hot, intense oh. summer sun and humidity. I forgot. Last time you had said it was June, and I'm thinking, ooh, yeah. and they're heading south. They're heading south, <laughs> and that's not bad enough. They also, the other thing that plagues us, too, in the summertime, mosquitoes. Mosquitoes, absolutely. Oh, and they couldn't get away from them, mm-hmm. you know. Well, luckily, as they're making their way down, they uh, visited one of the villages along the river, and they complained to the Indians about the heat and the mosquitoes, and the Indians gave them the answer. And we might want to think about this, too. Okay, this is how the Indians treated with both of those. They built scaffolding, uh, uh, six, seven feet up of the scaffolding, and then uh, they, they lit a fire underneath that. Now, what happened is that the floor of the scaffolding is made with poles that have slits in between. So you sleep up on top of this thing. There's The smoke is rising. Now, that's not going to be pleasant, you're, you know, but the, the other side of it is it drives the mosquitoes away. It drives mosquitoes away, but then you're also uh, roasting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. But it's at night, so it's okay, not so kind that of helps bad. a little. And then during the daytime, what you do is you douse the fire, and you go down, and you lay underneath the scaffolding, which then keeps the sun off of you. Okay. So it's okay. Take it for what it's worth. Right, right. Um, on July 14th, they came upon yet another village. And this was where the rulers of the village were old men. And um, they recognized Joliet's cal- calumet. Okay. And I'm speculating that these are Osage. Now, they don't they don't identify the, what what nation they are, but the Osage were ruled by the old men. In fact, they were, they were the uh, uh, the leadership was called the um, the little old men. Oh. You know, and, uh, and and so one of these little old men knew enough Illinois language so as to be able to uh, communicate with Father Marquette. And then welcomed the uh, Joliet Marquette expedition. The next day, the little old man, the Illinois speaker, and ten young braves went ahead and accompanied the French the two canoes for another 25 miles from the Oh my down. gosh! Yeah. So now they're below the Ohio River, right? Okay. They're below Cairo, Illinois. Okay. They're continuing on down another 25 miles. They come to another village that Father Marquette calls the Akamsia village. Okay. And again, there's another Illinois speaker there. And he tells um, Joliet and Marquette that the sea is only about 10, further, uh, 10 days further journey south. Okay. And he said, but when you get to the coast, you'll find other Europeans. 
and be between that and, uh, and, and where they are right now, it's filled with hostile natives. So it's not going to be, and, 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 the, and the people there, the uh, Akamsia, are not able to trade with the coast because of these um, uh, hostile tribes. And so at this point, um, they, the two got together and they decided, we've gone far enough. Okay. If we go much further, we will probably be killed by these hostile natives. We've been very lucky so far. And, in fact, in the um, Akamsia village, they didn't know this, but there were some people that were saying that they should kill all of the Frenchmen and because this is a bad omen. And the Illinois speaker persuaded them not to. Wow. So now it's getting to be a little dangerous. Uh -huh. And besides that, if they make it to the, 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 uh, the Gulf of Mexico, they're going to come across Spanish. Right. And the Spanish and that's are, not going to go well. Uh, no, it's not going to go well because <laughs> they're going to assume they're spies. Uh -huh. And they're going to imprison them or something worse. And so it, it's not worth it. So at this point, they knew everything they needed to know. Um, they knew where the uh, Mississippi River went, and so they had all the information that was uh, – they had solved the northern mystery. Okay. So let's turn around and, and, um, and go back up. And um, paddle now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, got that right. <laughs> um, it is – it is tough. I mean, uh, I, I've been on the Mississippi in a canoe going in the wrong direction. Uh, this was during the flood of 93. And, oh, my uh, God. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it was incredibly stupid on my part. Um, but, I, but I did it, uh, me and a, and a dog. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and, and I can tell you that when you stop paddling, you go the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. So this was constant. They really had to, to, to work at, at this uh, to go. And as they made their way back, slowly working up that river, they stopped at an Indian village. And um, the Indians, the, these are Illinois uh -huh. people, said to them, they said, um, uh, what, why are you going to go all the way up the Mississippi, all, all the way up to the Wisconsin River? He said, why don't you take this other river that's just over here on the right, and it's much easier. It was the Illinois River. Oh, okay. And so that's what they did was they followed the Illinois, which is a lovely little river, uh, to, to follow. And there they made their way all the way up uh, to, through the Illinois River. They did a, a small um, a portage. They carried their canoes a small distance near uh, a, 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 a huge field of wild garlic. Hmm. And uh, the Illinois people called it stinky fields because of its smell. <laughs> well. um, the word in Illinois for stinky fields is, <laughs> ready? Okay. <laughs> Chicago. <laughs> 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 it's only a St. Louis can get <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> and then thereafter, they made their way up to um, Lake Michigan. Okay, and then from Lake Michigan, they'll work their way back up uh, <laughs> to, to uh, the, their missions. Um, but here's something that really is fascinating. It's, it's really exciting, and, and that is this. Before they left, Father Marquette wrote a letter and gave it to the Indians in that area. And he said this, that the next time you come across a European, give them this letter. And, and he wrote it in Latin. Okay. Okay. And, uh, and we have a copy of it. Oh, wow. You know, it's a really fascinating thing. Um, he dates it August 4th, 1673, on the river of the Conception. Ah. So it's here that he names the river uh, after Our Lady of uh, you know, the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin. And it tells an awful lot. It's, I'm going to read part of this letter to you. I'll read the whole letter to you. Uh, the motivation of this wonderful explorer, this great man of God. Oh, great. Okay. And he writes this. And then I'll tell you the little pedigree of the, of the letter, how it comes to us today. Oh, okay. Great. Because, I mean, here's this guy writes this letter in the middle of America, nobody around. And he says, when you see a European, give it, give to, it to them. them. So, and we'll follow that. But this is what he says. Although by lowly obedience I am nobody, I sought to lead others, whoever they might be, to Christ our Savior. 
By chance it came to pass that, being seized by an impulse for spiritual things, I met these savages, who I believe are in friendly correspondence with Europeans. As I undertook nothing of what another as i understood nothing of which what they said it would please me very much if you whoever you may be whatever the latitude or longitude of your city would inform me who these savages may be meanwhile learn this from me the lord has called me to the society of jesus and wills that i live in the canadian region for the welfare of the savages whom he has redeemed by his blood wherefore if the immaculate virgin the mother of god be at my side i am certain to give up my life in these places although the most miserable since christ underwent so great sufferings for us he certainly did not wish that we would be sparing with the life with which he conserves for us so while we enjoy it let us pray to god that in heaven if never on earth he may unite us. And so he he gives, basically he gives his address. So what he's saying is, when you get this letter in the bottle, mm -hmm. okay, write to me and let me know who gave it to you. Right. Okay. Wait, right. Yeah. And that, that didn't Not happen, true. by the way. It didn't happen? It did not happen. Oh. Okay. okay. But this is what did happen, and it's even more exciting. Um, there's a book by, the, by entitled The Joliet Marquette Expedition of Ooh. 1673. Believe it or not. Wow. Yeah. And uh, it, it, it was published in 1928 by Francis Borgia Streck. Okay. And he follows the pedigree of this letter. Okay. Okay. Oh, fun. And this is actually comes from some research done by a Professor Charles Alford, uh, who had traced the letter and then published his findings in the American Historical Review of 1920. Wow. Okay, so here it goes. Ready? Okay. okay, the Indians gave the letter to a trader um, from Virginia. Okay. Okay, who was out there visiting. Two and a half years later, we find that letter back in Virginia in the hands of another Virginian by the name of William Byrd. Oh. Okay, so this trader had given the letter to another trader, and it's in Virginia. This letter is in Virginia. Oh, my gosh. Uh, okay. Now, he makes a copy of it, well, okay. okay, and then gives it to William Penn, the founder of Pennsylvania. Oh, my gosh. Right? Who then gave it to a man named Robert Harley, and his papers, all of his family papers, were all bound up and preserved at Welbeck Abbey back in England. Oh. They were discovered in 1893. Oh, my gosh. And after 220 years, 20, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, they're translated, and here we have Father Marquette's letter. Wow. Which is now published in these books. <laughs> <laughs> to give to a European made it back to Europe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Virginia. Virginia. So, yeah. Interesting. To Virginia, mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, England. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's that's really exciting. It is, and and it's a real insight into this man. What what motivated him? What drew him to do what he did? Uh -huh. You know. Well, um, they found the mouth of the Illinois River. Uh -huh. The expedition then made its way up. They got to the village of the Kaskaskia Indians. Oh, wow, okay. Okay, this is near present uh, Utica, Illinois, and here, uh, Father Marquette. Um, made a promise to come back to the uh, Illinois people and to be with them. Oh, okay. okay. Um, he was helped by one of the chiefs and several of the young braves. As they made their way further north, they were given um, directions to the Des Plaines River. Okay. And there, that's when they portaged their canoes to the Chicago River, made their way then to Lake Michigan. They arrived back where they started at, at um, well, this is St. Francis Xavier Mission near Green Bay. They arrived back in September. Now, Marquette had to stay. Father Marquette was is not of a uh, healthy uh, constitution. For a man that's doing all of this, he was quite sick. Oh. And so he stayed there at uh, St. Francis Xavier Mission and uh, recovered himself, got got well enough then. And um, 
At the same time, uh, uh, Louis Joliet then went ahead and he began exploring the southern part of Lake Michigan, basically looking for minerals. Remember that this is for him a commercial venture. He's just not out there to have fun. Right, right. You know, and and so eventually, then in November, Joliet went back, joined Marquette at the mission at Saint Francis Xavier, and there they overwintered, and. Joliet wrote an account of his his account of the expedition. Oh, okay, Father Marquette already has his, right? His, his daily, uh-huh. Right, and so, um, and now um, he writes, Joliet writes his own. He then gives a copy of this to Father Marquette. Okay. And that becomes really important a little bit later on. In May of 1674, Joliet now begins his journey back to Quebec. He gathers his notes, his equipment, uh, his crew, his his 11-year-old boy, remember oh, right, that, that slave, right. he's still with him. And uh, and so they all begin making their way uh, back up, up toward Quebec. Uh, they go along the north shore of, of Lake Ontario. And around this time, he comes across a brand new fort that had just been built, Fort Frontenac, okay. named after the governor. We'll talk a little bit about that later on. And he also meets the commander of that fort, a, a Frenchman by the name of Robert LaSalle. Mm-hmm. And we'll be seeing a lot of him pretty soon, too. Their conversations absolutely inspired LaSalle to want to explore the Mississippi region, too, and to do it in even greater depth. Okay. Okay. By mid-July, Joliet and his companions had floated down the St. Lawrence River. Remember, they floated down the river this time. It was a little <laughs> bit more comfortable. Uh-huh. Okay, they're coming along, and eight miles short of the city of Montreal is what's called the Falls of St. Louis. Okay. okay. Now, so in other words, it's, it's, a, it's a cataract. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, normally what happens is traders will pull off to the side, they'll dock, they'll take all of their wares, they'll put them on carts, and then they'll cart the rest of it into the city of Montreal. Okay. okay. It's going to take a little bit longer to do that, but it's safer. Okay. Joliet figures it's late Saturday afternoon. He wants to get to Montreal before sunset. Yeah. He's pretty eager, and so he decides he's going to run the rapids. Oh, my gosh. You know what's coming. Oh. Yeah. If successful, everything is fine. Mm -hmm. And, in fact, the worst of the rapids, he does successfully uh, skirt. Everything's fine, seems to be. The rowers, however, grew careless, and they let the canoe come perpendicular to the river current. When that happened, the boats capsized, Mm -hmm. and with that, everyone went over, all the equipment went over, the notes went over, the maps went over, and it it turned out that that, um, Joliet swam for his life, got to a rock in in the river where he was then saved by uh, some fishermen. All of his companions and that young boy were drowned. Oh, my gosh. That was a very sad, sad ending. Oh. He lost all of his equipment. He lost his original report. Thankfully, he gave that copy to Marquette. Yes, definitely. He, very saddened with his loss, Yeah. went on from Montreal to Quebec. He spent some time with his um, elderly mother and his brother, Zachary, who was his business partner. He then spent time at their home, and he reconstructed from memory the report the best he could. Wow. But all the maps were lost. Mm-hmm. Okay. He tried to do the maps, but um, uh, and, and then one of the things he tried to do was kind of butter up to Governor Frontenac, who was not going to be a happy camper with this, you know. And so he, uh, when he drew a map of that region, he entitled the Mississippi Riviere Bode named after uh, uh, Frontenac, okay, (laughs) as a way to compliment him the best he could. Thereafter, he visited the Jesuits uh, who were there and gave a report on Father Marquette and uh, and how things were going. The superior there, Father Dablon, wasted no time 
in October of 1674, he sent Jesuits out to visit with Father Marquette. And there they made copies of the copy that Joliet had left oh. at, at Mission St. Francis Xavier and then sent that copy back to Quebec. Okay, okay so you had now the, the whole copy. And then um, the Jesuits who had been sent out then began making plans for setting missions up for the Illinois people. And so a new phase of uh, evangelization was uh, was about to begin. All right. Okay. Well, uh, all of this um, is a, a little bug in the ear of this Robert LaSalle. Okay. And so it would be good for us to uh, to talk a little bit about um, about him. And, uh, and, and in a sense, it's, this is the next generation okay. of... Um, of of adventures and 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 um, uh, the evangelization and, and and coming into into um, the the Midwest, uh, but keep in mind that Robert LaSalle is not is not at all interested. He's a Catholic, uh -huh. and his father his brother in fact is a Sulpician uh, priest. Okay, um, but he has no love of the Jesuits, and uh, and and so uh, there's going to be a, uh, some animosity in all of that. So by the time we um, get to October of seventeen or of sixteen seventy four, we find Father Marquette and two of his Jesuit companions, and they're now going to leave uh, Mission Saint Ignace again. This is going to be the second time. Remember, the first mm -hmm. time was discovery. This time was going to be evangelization, and they made their way down the shore of Lake Michigan. Now this is October. Mm, okay. Uh, you know, it's, I don't know if that was a wise move, but he promised he would come back. But, mm -hmm. you know, this is a little, uh, a little iffy as far as the weather goes. And, in fact, it was very tough going. Choppy waters. Um, you know, have you ever been to Chicago and gone out on the pier and looked at Lake Michigan? It is freezing. <laughs> yeah, it is. In October, and you really don't want to be in a canoe, you no. know. Um, anyway, he, they do. They're going down. They're, uh, they're eventually joined by some 50 Illinois and Potawatomi oh, wow. in nine different canoes. So there's oh, a real wow. flotilla that's going down there. The weather is stormy. The mm -hmm. progress is slow. Um, Father Marquette admits that they're making about five miles a day. Wow. It's going to take a long time. They didn't reach the Chicago River until December 4th. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. Snow. The river itself, they enter the river, and the Chicago River is frozen over. <laughs> Six inches of ice. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And Father Marquette's health is failing again. So finally, they're sludging their way down until December 14th when they decided that it's just too dangerous. And so what they did was they sheltered in place. They made a, a little shelter, a, a lean-to. They got a fire going, um, and they were going to wait until the weather broke because they couldn't go any further. The this is December. Oh, yeah. We're just beginning the winter. I know. <laughs> well, so the Indians had all left them by the next day, uh -huh. and they went out hunting. That's what they were intending oh, okay. to do. Um, they had, um, uh, before they left, they had traded with the Jesuits, and they gave the Jesuits something that they needed very, very badly, and that was buffalo robes. Oh. So they were all bundled coats. up. Yeah. <laughs> a buffalo, in these buffalo uh, uh coats and robes uh, and um and they had traded them for tobacco <laughs> so there you go uh something to smoke in that calumet i guess right, that's right um so you can get this scene of this thick snow it's northern illinois outside of Ch what is now chicago didn't mm -hmm. exist at the time but um there they are in this in this little hut uh got a fire going they're all wrapped up in these buffalo robes and and all of a sudden, they hear voices. It's two French trappers. Oh, okay. They had heard from the Indians that Father Marquette was there with with some other oh. Jesuits. They walked. And this is absolutely incredible. They walked fifty miles, five o oh, miles, in order to bring dried blueberries and dried corn 
to the Jesuits oh my God. to help them see themselves through. And, of course, blueberries, are, they didn't know that it was high in antioxidants, right. but they knew it was good for you. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, so they're bringing health food to Father Mark Cat. Oh, my gosh, who desperately needs it. Oh, yeah, definitely. Well, eventually winter broke. The Jesuits continued down the Des Plaines River, and they arrived at uh, Indian Town, or I'm sorry, Illinois Town, on April 10th. Okay. Okay. Wow. Three days before Easter. Oh, okay. Beautiful. So yeah, and and so um, one of the accounts says, and I, I quote here, he was received like an angel from heaven. Oh. Oh, you couldn't imagine it. Yeah. Well, Father Marquette attempted to say mass on Easter Sunday barely got through, and he was so weak. And with that, the Jesuits decided they had to return back north and to care for him. And so a large party of uh, Illinois warriors conducted him part of the way. He got up um, up onto Lake Michigan. Again, they're going up Lake Michigan, when on May 18th of, uh, of 1675, Father Jacques Marquette, Aged 38 years old, oh my God. died on the shores wow. of Lake Michigan. Wow. He was buried there. The other Jesuits made um, note of where he was buried, and eventually they were able to come back and exhume his bones and bring them up to the Mission St. Ignace, where he was then buried. Wow. Yeah. What 38 were years old. Yeah. Isn't that something? What an incredible life. Uh, one of the best historians of this period is a man by the name of Charles Balassi, and he wrote a book entitled The Time of the French in the Heart of America, 1673 mm. to 1818. Oh. It was published in 1992, and I had an opportunity to meet him when he visited St. Genevieve. Oh, uh, yeah? Yeah. But he said this, and you know, besides being an historian, he was also a, a soldier in the French army uh, during uh, the time of the Algerian War. And so he, he's writing that. Uh, Balassi's writing is a soldier as well as a um, as a uh, historian. Okay. And his his next comment about the death of Marquette and the Jesuit response is very telling. And I think this is a good way to end our episode okay. today. He says this: the death of Father Marquette did not stop the missionary work begun by the Jesuits in Illinois. The Jesuits, like soldiers. Replaced fallen comrades, and Father Claude Alloway was ordered to replace Marquette. Ah, uh, it's a whole new era taking place then. Right. Yeah. And then the change begins. And yeah. yeah. So we'll we'll take over from there with. A, we'll f- see Father Alloway, Alloway. and uh, his his work, his tremendous work, and then uh, Robert LaSalle coming in with his incredible expedition. Uh, down the rest of the Mississippi. All right. Great. Okay, well, Father, thank you so much again. And can you close with a prayer and your blessing? Glory to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was was in the the beginning, beginning, is now, now, and and ever shall be, be, world world without without end. end. Amen. Amen. May Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. And thanks for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.